This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. It's my great pleasure uh, to introduce the uh, keynote speaker, Linda Birnbaum, to you all now. Uh, most of you know uh, Dr. Birnbaum. She's the director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and the perfect person to uh, lead off our, our, uh, our, our conference. Um, as most of you know, uh, Dr. Birnbaum's a toxicologist. She's worked for most of her career uh, in federal agencies at the uh, Environmental Protection Agency for something like uh, 19 or 20 years, uh, and uh, then as a senior scientist at the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences. And she's been director there uh, for, I think, now three years? Uh, it'll be four, I don't know. Time flies, so four. <laughs> uh, Linda's been a great supporter of this program. Uh, her own work, um, uh, is very parallel to what we are doing in the project. Uh, she, as I say, is the perfect person to um, introduce the science and the support that the uh, NIH has for this kind of activity. We're very pleased to have uh, Dr. Birnbaum lead off the, the show. Let's welcome her. So first of all, it's really my pleasure, t totally my pleasure to be here. It's, it's kind of depressing to me, actually, that the last time that I spoke before this group was three years ago when it was in Sausalito. And I, I'm going to commit to make sure I get to the meeting next year or the year after that, because this is too important a group doing too important work, which is actually personally very, very dear to my heart, not to be at these meetings more frequently. That being said, um, I, I make that as a promise, but sometimes I can't keep them all. <laughs> Anyhow, um, what I'd like to do before I actually uh, talk somewhat about uh, the, this BSERP, and then I want to talk about the new NIEHS strategic plan, is I really want to do a call out and a thanks to all the program staff from NIEHS and NCI. They don't get thanked enough for the fabulous job they do in helping to conceptualize and organize and run the program that you are all in. So could they all stand and not give them a Come on. I mean, I can't tell you what a great group of people we have working on this program. So as you all know, BSERP is kind of unique. Um, it's not only unique because it has two institutes working together. It's not only unique because it goes all the way from soup to nuts, or really molecular biology, to actually clinical studies, epidemiology, animal studies, in vitro work, and so on. It's not unique because its focus is so much on windows of susceptibility. What makes it really, really, really unique is the complete involvement of communities from the get-go in this program. And that's something, while I didn't start it, I am more than thrilled to celebrate it and encourage it. We cannot do the kinds of studies that we want to do related to environmental health unless we have the communities involved. They're the ones who know what the problems are. They're the ones who now ha who can help us figure out how to address the issues. So I really want to thank all of our community groups very, very much. It looks like the breast cancer incidence has been relatively flat. It's highest among white women, but it is increasing among African Americans and Asian Pacific Islanders. But what is a, um, and it says, so, says it's kind of flat, and the mortality is, may actually be decreasing slightly. But I have to tell you that with the um, general cessation of hormone replacement therapy in about 2002, 2003, we did see a decrease 
in incidence of breast cancer and new identification of breast cancer, but that has started to pick up again. And if you think about the mechanisms that are involved in many breast cancers, especially the ones that have a hormonal mediation, what they're doing is they're slowly promoting out cells that, are, that um, have um, become um, malignant. And we're, so we're now beginning to see a rise in the population again. The other thing I think that's real important is not only that the age of onset appears to be um, youngest among African American women, but overall the mortality is highest among African American women. And maybe part of that is because of the triple negative breast cancers, which are so resistant to therapy. But there may be other issues, especially related to environmental exposures and whole issues of environmental justice that we need to be concerning um, and looking at as well. So what are the risk factors that we know about um, for breast cancer for women? Some of them are things that we can't change, but such as, for example, whatever your genes are. Um, and you can't change what your family history. Um, if you're a woman, um, you can't change whether your mother, for example, took DES, or your, I should say, your grandmother um, had taken DES for all the good reasons that they thought that would help prevent miscarriage, but it turns out to have been a disaster. Um, we, none of us can stop the aging process, although some of us try pretty hard um, <laughs> with exercise and diet and mental activity and all that kind of thing, but basically we cannot stop aging. Um, some people would say that we can't adjust the age at menarche or the age at menopause, and yet we're finding more and more chemicals that in fact can modulate the, the age of when a woman go, when a, a girl, I should say, um, becomes a woman, or when a woman goes through menopause. Um, breastfeeding is something that um, we are beginning to see more and more women doing again. I can tell you that when I had my kids in the 70s and 80s, um, you know, especially when, when I had my son in the 70s, the fact that I was breastfeeding made me a real weirdo. Uh, I mean, very few women were breastfeeding. Today, most women are breastfeeding, but I think we have to be very, very careful that as much as we encourage breastfeeding for all the good things it does for our women and our babies, we need to realize that some women are not able to breastfeed, even with all the best intentions, and we have to be sure that we don't guilt trip those who, who have a problem. You know, wet nurses were around for, for eons, and there were good reasons they were there. Um, High breast um, tissue density is something that I think many of, there's really, really no control over it, although I do want to come to the issue, and I'm going to drop to the issue of obesity, because we know that obesity is a risk factor for breast cancer as well as many other um, health conditions. Um, and while we think that, or we keep telling people, diet, watch what you eat, exercise, what about the obesogens? What about the chemicals that we now know may in fact predispose you? Early exposure may alter your set point, making you more, making much more difficult for you to lose weight no matter how hard you exercise or how hard you diet. We all know that things like radiation um, can contribute to, to breast cancer um, risk. We know that um, alcohol is a, uh, a risk factor for breast cancer, and I kind of get concerned when I hear them say that, you know, even one drink a day may be a little bit problematic. I'm not a big drinker, but sometimes, like at a meeting, I love having a glass of wine. Anyway, but I think we need to be aware that there are um, many, many different kind of exposures, many, many different lifestyle factors, many different genetic factors, all that um, are risk factors for breast cancer. Um, oh, I actually want to go back, because this title says breast cancer risk factors for women. And you know, we've got pink ribbons, and we talk about breast cancer in women. We should not forget that over 2,000 men every year um, get breast cancer, and men die of breast cancer as well. And that, that's a population that has been neglected in this whole field. So um, if we say how much, you know, what are the contribution of the different uh, risk factors to breast cancer? Um, you know, this is already 15, 18 years ago that it was that we concluded that about 25 to 50 percent of U.S. cases, we, we could explain them by the risk factors we knew about. We know that genetic factors only explain about 5, 10, 5 to 10 percent of the cases of breast cancer. 
So it could be that environmental factors could explain 75% of the breast cancer risk. And there are many different environmental agents studied um, that have been associated um, with potential for breast cancers. And I should say that this li list is not an inclusive list. I mean, I was looking at this myself and kind of scratching my head and said, where are the dioxins, since that's one of my favorite? Where are some of the metals? Um, arsenic, cadmium, um, for example. You know, so, but the, on this list, we know, think about phthalates. We're all exposed. Every woman who put on a little makeup today or a little bit of perfume probably you know, exposed herself to phthalates, never mind nanomaterials, and I won't go into the potential safety of nanomaterials. Um, PCBs, you know, PCBs are a legacy pollutant. Uh, they were made for a very important purpose starting in about the mid-1920s. Um, their production was banned in this country in the 1970s and not banned in, the, uh, in Russia until almost um, 2000. But 70% of those that were ever made are still out there and still circulating. And while there was a huge effort that was done in the past to look at the association of PCBs in breast cancer, they were asking the wrong question. And maybe I'll come back to that later, because they were looking for what are the chemicals that you're exposed to when you have a tumor. And you know what? We all know that cancers don't appear, you know, at, you know, just at the turn of the turn of the screw or whatever. I'm very bad at mixing metaphors. But anyhow, you know, the point is, is, is that it took a long time for that cancer to develop. And so that, I'll come back to the whole issues of window susceptibility and then issues of latency. Um, there's growing evidence of an association with different kind of phenols, and BPA is just one of them. Um, growing evidence, again, from especially from our animal data, about some of the perfluorinated compounds. And um, you know, those of us who like to hike and bike and go out in nature are very happy to have our Gore-Tex shoes and, and raincoats and so on. But what is being used to waterproof um, some of those clothing and shoes that we wear, some of these chemicals that we are having growing concerns about. Uh, phytoestrogens, uh, tobacco smoke, um, you know, finally, after many years, there is an association with breast cancer. Uh, the PBDEs will come, and we're going to hear a lot more about the flame retardants. And um, I want to just put out the, in fact, I think when I spoke three years ago, I actually gave a research talk, and I talked about brominated flame retardants um, and some of the research that I did in that area. But I want to remind you or alert you to the fact, and we're going to have a whole session on flame retardants tomorrow, is that PBDEs are no longer being made, but they're like PCBs. They're going to be with us for the next 30, 50, maybe 100 years. But they are just the tip of the iceberg. There are loads and loads of other flame retardants out there. And most of them we know almost nothing about as far as their human health effects. And then concern with the organochlorine pesticides, um, which are, again, many of these are no longer being made. Um, but they're still out there. They're legacy compounds. Again, they're going to be with us for the future. You know, DDT hasn't been used in this country for 40 years, and yet everyone in this room has DDT residues in their bodies. So the whole issue of windows of susceptibility in some ways has fed into the development of this whole new paradigm of the developmental origins of, um, of health and adult disease. And I think one thing um, that's important, and may, may, many of you may not realize, there's a whole society now. There's a journal, all focusing on the DOHAD issues. Some of us used to call it FEBAD, which was the fetal basis of adult disease. But as you all know, and I'm going to show, I think especially in this group knows, there are multiple windows of susceptibility. They're not all in utero. Um, I think we forget about often what happens before conception ever occurs. And I would remind us that, that fathers matter. And we ought to be thinking about um, the exposure to the males as well as, as well as the women. But the DOHAD paradigm is that environmental insults, again, broadly defined during early development, can increase the disease risk later in life. I think many of you know that a lot of this has been stimulated by the work done by, um, you know, done related to the famine that occurred in the Netherlands and in Britain at the end of World War II, um, often called the Barker Hypothesis. And when those, you know, in countries that have good medical records um, and good medical treatment for the whole population, you can look and follow people for 40, 50, or 60 years and see that at that point, these people who had nutritional stress or nutritional deprivation in utero, in fact, 
have um, elevated levels of uh, chronic non-communicable diseases, heart disease, cancer, obesity, diabetes. And there is now some evidence, actually, that children of survivors um, from Nazi survivors of Nazi concentration camps and their children, that their children, uh, this is a second generation effect that we're seeing elevated increases of some of these chronic non-communicable diseases basically in the grandchildren. Um, so I've already mentioned that the windows of susceptibility, um, there are multiple periods in a lifespan. Um, we often think of, you know, we think about prenatal, we think about infants, sometimes we think about children, but you know, we also know that puberty um, adolescence, um, pregnancy, um, as well as uh, old age are periods of unique susceptibility. Um, I think during development, it's most easy to understand it because you've got cells rapidly dividing and differentiating or tissues and organs forming, and it's easy to understand that if you throw a monkey wrench into the process, it's going to have long-lasting um, consequences. So this is just kind of a slide of, of a very, this is kind of a simple slide, but showing how effects in utero cannot be actually, uh, may, la may be latent, and you may not actually be able to detect them until different stages of life. I could make this much more complex, but I don't like complex slides, um, because actually we could put arrows going from childhood, from puberty, from reproductive life. Um, from middle life and older age. And we could probably take some of the reproductive life ones and feed them back into gestation, because exposures at that time can have impacts on the developing embryo fetus as well. So if we focus on breast cancer and the possibility for windows of susceptibility during a life cycle, we know that there are many different um, periods of development of the breast, and all of the changes seem to occur gradually, there are really specific times when more rapid changes take place. And they, when these changes are occurring is, are the windows that the breasts are most vulnerable. So the BSERP projects, we are trying to address this issue of windows of susceptibility. We have um, different investigators focusing on the prenatal period. Uh, the prepubertal and the pubertal periods are being looked at. We don't have anyone focusing on adolescence. Um, I think that's a hole that I would love to see filled in our portfolio as we go forward. We have a little bit of effort focused on pregnancy um, and, and postpartum, and I think that that's another area that we could look at. I mean, uh, the, the woman's breast during pregnancy undergoes massive changes um, and during lactation as well, and I think those are oppor unfortunately opportunities for perturbation. And then we're not really looking at what happens during menopause as, um, very well. We have people looking over the entire life course, looking at the architecture of the gland across the lifespan, and we have people looking at the genetics of breast cancer risk. So a very important part of this program um, that involves uh, not only the entire grantee program, but especially our community groups are training the next generation. And I'd like any of the students who are here, over the years we've brought at least 100 students over the past nine years to these meetings to participate. Are any of the students here and they can stand up and we can give you a round of applause because we're so happy that you're here and excited to be here. Thank you. And I would urge all of you, don't be shy. This is your time. Ask questions you know, of the scientists, of the community activists. Find out all the things that you can do. The sooner we can get young people involved in understanding and excitement for science, the better it is um, as we go forward in the future. So I also, obviously, I've already mentioned our community partners, but here's a, a list. Um, and, and we, again, we couldn't do this without all of you. It's, it's just wonderful to have you involved. I think many of you do know that within several months of my becoming director of NIEHS, I instituted a policy that all of our center programs, all of our coordinator programs, had to have community um, engagement from the very beginning. Um, but I think the Breast Cancer and the Environment Research Program is one of the models for complete integration of the advocacy um, groups into the science. We've also worked very hard um, working again with our community groups in developing messaging toolkits. Um, these are all culturally appropriate and um, in written in plain language. 
But I think that they are going to be very, very helpful for working in the communities, understanding, helping people understand what they can do, what actions they can take to um, help themselves. We also have our community groups have been very active in developing different kinds of outreach and interactions. I think many of you have actually watched the Breast Biologues. Um, that was a, ve a very excellent program. We've got lots of fact sheets that NIEHS actually puts out looking at environmental factors in breast cancer. We have a lot of multi-language newsletters and reports and web pages and, again, community forums and national meetings. Some of you may know that I try to go around the country and every year do several, uh, we used to call them town hall meetings until town hall meetings got a di dirty word in 2009 and 2010, so now we call them community forums. But it's an opportunity for, for me to dialogue with um, people in the community to understand what their concerns are. We're also trying to reach the public. I think many of you probably read this article that was featured in the New York Times called Puberty Before Age 10, A New Normal. I think we all know, and it's been um, very clearly demonstrated by the work of Frank Bureau and his colleagues, um, that the age of puberty continues to decrease. Um, and so I think it's by age seven, about 20% of girls actually are starting into puberty by age eight. It's about 40% or maybe even higher. I know that my eight and a half year old granddaughter um, has her little breast buds um, moving and I look and I look at this little tomboy and I think she's not ready for this. Um, and I think it's something that we all are beginning to have to deal with. Um, so I want to talk now a little bit about the Breast Cancer and the Environment Research Act of 2008 and the committee that has come out of this work called the IBISERC Committee. And if I were to tell you that it took quite a while for all of us to be able to say that, but it's the Interagency Breast Cancer and the Environment uh, or Research Coordinating Committee. <laughs> um, but this act was signed into law by, the pres by uh, President Bush on October 8th, 2008. Um, one of its leaders was Sue Myrick, who is a Republican from Charlotte, North Carolina, and was a breast cancer survivor. Um, this actually amended the Public Health Service Act, which is our authorizing legislation, at, to establish a committee composed of not just feds, not just non-feds, um, but also advocate, advocacy and people interested in breast cancer as well. And the, uh, this, the, this effort to run the committee um, and produce a report was delegated to the NIH from Secretary Sebelius. And um, Dr. Collins then, well, it takes a while for things to happen in the government. It took almost a year and then the uh, authority was delegated to um, NIH, but we run it with NCI in partnership as well. So the charge to the committee was to share and coordinate information on existing research activities, um, to develop a concentrate, a comprehensive strategy and advise the NIH and other federal agencies um, in the solic solicitation of proposals for collaborative multidisciplinary work, develop a summary of advances in breast cancer research conducted by federal agencies uh, relative to diagnosis, prevention, and treatment, and then make recommendations to the secretary um, for any appropriate changes to research activities um, reduction of unnecessary duplications of effort and increasing the involvement of patient advocacy and community um, groups. So this is just a picture of the IBISER committee. Uh, we have several members who are here. Could they just quickly stand up? I know I'm making people stand and stuff, but I, I really, they've done a great job too. Um, you're all going to ask, well, when does this report come out? Uh, let's just say it is in its very, uh, fi very, very final stages of, you know, kind of proofreading and making sure that everything is lined up and so on. And we um, intend to get it to the secretary later this month. And the hope is now that the election is over that uh, she will issue it quite rapidly after that. Whoops. So I just wanted to tell you who was on the committee. Um, we have the federal representatives, for example. Um, we have uh, Christine Ambersoni, Rachel Abelard-Bashad, Sue Fenton, 
uh, Sally Prodarni from EPA, Marcus Plesha from CDC, and uh, Gail Vady from the Department of Defense. You all know that DOD has a very large breast cancer research program. And why did they get that research program instead of NIH? Well, basically, because at that time, NIH couldn't get its act together. Um, but that was a long time ago. Um, so from non-federal representatives, these are scientists, physicians, and other health professionals. Michelle Foreman, who was actually the chair of the committee, the overall chair of the committee. Mike Gould and Sandy Haslam are here. Um, Rhonda Henry Tillman, uh, Ken Portier from the American Cancer Society, and Cheryl Walker. And I'm going to come back to Cheryl in a, in a moment. And actually, Cheryl is now at Texas A&M's University in, in Houston, their center in Houston. And then our advocacy, our non-federal reps, um, Janice Barlow, who um, is here, Bev Kanan, uh, Isabel Duran, uh, Karen Miller, Laura Nicolaitis, and Jeannie Rizzo. Um, and everyone has worked hard and collaboratively um, to achieve consensus um, for this document. Um, now, I did want to mention, and some people thought this might be redundant, was that at the same time we got IBISERC going, the Institute of Medicine was funded to conduct a study on breast cancer and the environment. And I'm pleased to say that not only do some members of our committee actually get to, to, for example, present information to the Institute of Medicine committee, but Cheryl Walker served on both committees, so we had a liaison basically back and forth. But their recommendations for research included applying a life course perspective and a transdisciplinary approach to studies of breast cancer developing new and better tools for research, developing effective preventative interventions and better approaches to modeling breast cancer risks, and improving communication about breast cancer risks to healthcare providers, policymakers, and the public. Many of these things are inherent in um, the efforts that BSERP is already um, ongoing. So I now want to switch and talk about the NIEHS strategic plan. And I heard when I met with some of our um, advocacy groups this morning that they've all read it, or many of them read it. I thought that was pretty great. Um, but this is the basically planning for the next five years for the directions of NIEHS. Um, this has been a very inclusive process that I'm going to kind of go through, kind of not at not a typical way to develop a strategic plan, but I think actually one that has turned out extremely effective. Um, the first thing we did is in February 2011, we put up a website and we said, you know, give us your great ideas, your visionary ideas. And we received hundreds of visionary ideas. We got comments on many of these ideas. We had many other people who read about the ideas and spoke verbally to us and let us know information. And then we gave the opportunity, uh, we clustered these ideas because you have hundreds and hundreds of ideas. You have to kind of cluster them into the topics that they fell under. And we had over 10,000 people actually vote on what they thought were some of the best ideas. And this is all available on our website, so you can look at what the ideas were. I should mention that everything was done anonymously, so that if someone wanted to say, I think that's a hunk of hooey, they could say it and nobody would know who they were addressing that comment to or who it was coming from. Um, then we had a series of stakeholder and community workshops. And um, I was mentioning to, to the group this morning, someone was saying, take off your hats. Well, that was the first thing I did at this meeting was I went in and I had a series of hats. I started with um, my sombrero. And then I went through a series of hats urging everyone, because we had scientists and policymakers and uh, managers of research and communication folks and NIEHSers all together. And I said, you all have to take off your hats here. You know, if you are doing basic gene repair, that's not what you're here to talk about today. If you're an epidemiologist who's focusing on the environmental impacts on cleft palate, that's not what the focus is today. Take off your hat and say, where should environmental health sciences move in the next five to 10 years? And we did it by a fabulous new approach, which, you know, this would actually be a fun group to do it with if we wanted to before the next um, envisioning for the BSERP program as we go. You get everybody in a big room, you put them in a huge circle. Okay, now with 200 people, we couldn't really fit in one circle. We had kind of two circles, one inside the other. And then 
you, after, we, after the facilitator kind of charged the group, there were, there were a stack of papers and magic markers. And people were supposed to come up and write their visionary idea and go post it on the wall. It's a big room. And if I were to tell you that I was, before this was, I was sleepless for nights before this because I thought, oh my god, we're going to be sitting in this big room and nobody is going to want to be first. And nobody is going to stand up. And as soon as the facilitator basically finished, I don't think she'd even sat down, there were 90 people lined up to give their ideas. So it was great, the excitement, the involvement that we have all the people at this meeting. Anyhow, we came um, from this meeting, really we ended up with um, strategic planning themes of basic research on health and disease, exposure science and exposome, translational science, Broadly defined, guys, translational science at NIHS is not just bench to bedside. It goes often bench to bedside or bench to public health or sometimes bench to policy. Uh, collaborative and integrative approaches for research, data management and analysis, global environmental health and health disparities, training of the environmental science workforce and communication and outreach. And I really don't like the term, but it's too late now. It should say communication and engagement probably, rather than outreach. So then we had another workshop, which was a little bit smaller. And this, again, involves some NIHSers and different stakeholder groups. And the objective of this was to draft the mission and vision statement and uh, the supporting themes, and then to kind of go forward with it. And this is where we kind of ended up. And I call this my cloud diagram. Um, the original way that we looked at the themes were, was like a Greek temple with pillars and a roof because we had these overarching themes of collaborative and integrated approaches and knowledge management. And I said, wait a minute, that's stovepipes. And the whole point is that these themes overlap and you often have to be involved in more than one or two of these in order to conduct your research. But the mission of NIHS is to discover how the environment affects people in order to promote healthier lives. And our vision, is to provide global leadership for innovative research that improves public health by preventing disease and disability. So the really new things in this strategic plan is the focus on public health and prevention, which had really um, not been present in the last strategic plan. So after we had this, we have our themes, we have our mission and vision, then we had to develop the goals. And we had all this hard work that had been done prior um, to the leadership getting together to spearhead the process. We got all of our divisions, and NIHS has three divisions and two offices. So the office of the director, which has things like communication, environmental health perspectives, um, diversity and education outreach, and so on. We have the office of management, and you all know what management folks do, like budget and administration and security and all that kind of stuff. And then we have our three research divisions. We have our extramural research division, which is the group that funds all of you. We have our intramural research division, like any NIH institute that conducts basic fundamental research. And then we have the division of the National Toxicology Program, which is actually a cross-agency effort that's headquartered at NIEHS. And much of its research is conducted by a, a contract, uh, R&D contract mechanism for some of the long-term testing and test development. But we also have a small on-site um, targeted research program that DNTB conducts. But all of these groups um, developed, um, had retreats to develop institutional strategic goals that were based on the themes. They were all collected and coalesced into a single list. And we reviewed them, um, organized and prioritized them, and developed a set of 11 institutional goals. And what I often say when people say 11, that's a weird number. My husband's a mathematician. 11 is much more interesting since it's a prime. Anyway, so, <laughs> so I'm just going to very briefly go through the strategic goals. Again, this is all available on the website. Um, I don't know if we actually brought any hard copies to this meeting. Um, you know, with the new executive order that came out from the president, we're supposed to reduce printing costs and assume that everybody has access to the internet. Not such a good assumption in some cases. Um, but anyhow, you can all look at it um, on the internet if you haven't already looked at it. This is the fundamental mechanistic goal, um, the identification and understanding fundamental shared mechanisms of common pathways underlying a broad range of complex diseases. 
and order. Why are we doing that? To develop uh, applicable prevention and intervention strategies. And under this goal, there are a number of sub-goals, looking at genome structure and fun function, looking at epigenetic regulation, um, trying to understand what are protective mechanisms and how they're regulated. We have to understand normal development if we're going to understand how environmental exposures can perturb development. We're trying to develop a pipeline to integrate high throughput testing, um, cell systems and model organisms to identify fundamental mechanisms. Um, we've got a big effort right now looking to try to do, um, use induced pluripotent stem cells in rapid testing methods because you can take those cells and differentiate them into any part, almost any tissue or organ system of the body. The second goal, this is the lifespan goal, so trying to understand susceptibility across um, the lifespan and how d um, complex diseases or disorders can result from environmental um, factors. This involves both basic and population studies. And again, why are we doing it? Prevention and decrease the public health burden. So we're trying to identify critical windows of susceptibility. And I spoke a little about critical windows in terms of breast cancer before, but realize that different organ systems, different tissues are going to have different critical windows of susceptibility. Um, we're trying to understand the relationship between like exposures and the response, and they may vary across different times of the lifespan, and try to determine what it is that uh, leads to individual susceptibility across the lifespan. Uh, the third goal is really exposure science. Um, exposure science, we tend to be looking one exposure at a time, whether it's one chemical at a time, or one dietary um, component at a time, or one infectious agent at a time. But in fact, we have to begin to look at the totality of human exposure and try to create a blueprint for incorporating this into human health studies. I should mention that the National Academies just released a report in, November, in September on exposure science in the 21st century, um, which lays out many of the issues. I have to say that it is not as uh, paradigm-shifting a report as tox toxicity testing in the 21st century, which came out in 2007. But we want to increase the characterization of exposures through improved assessment at both individual and population levels. We are very excited about the concept of the exposome, which is an agnostic approach to look at the totality of exposures. And we really need new tools and technologies um, in order to go forward there. The fourth goal is really looking at combined environmental exposures and how this affects disease um, pathogenesis. Some people think environmental health only focuses on chemical stressors. Other people think environmental health are, are things more like the built environment or and, and physical kind of stressors. Everything is really part of the environment. We can't do it all, but we can raise the consciousness that it all needs to be considered and it has to be looked at um, in interacting ways. I think it's very important that, um, that for example, nutrition and diet has a major impact on how you do respond to different environmental chemicals. Um, I actually did a study looking at um, the effects on breast cancer with a graduate student of mine a number of years ago, Michelle Lamerell, and we showed that if animals were on a high fat diet as opposed to a low fat diet, you know, their breast development was totally screwed up and they had an increased incidence, the mice, I should say, of breast cancer. But those on a low fat diet, we saw almost no effect at all from prenatal TCDD exposure. So again, the interaction between the two. We're really interested in the microbiome. I think you know babies born by vaginal delivery have a different microbiome than babies born by C-section. We don't know what does that mean. You know, we know that people who are, for example, strict vegetarians have a very different microbiome than somebody who is a heavy meat eater. What does that mean, not only in terms of your health directly, but in terms of your interaction with different kinds of stressors? We want to look at the interactions of infectious agents with environmental exposures. There's several papers, and I've been challenging our children's health centers to look at the issue showing that children who are exposed in utero to PCBs or dioxins or the perfluorinated compounds have a reduced ability to mount an antibody response. We now have several studies in the literature showing that children don't have, or that children with the higher levels of prenatal exposure have low, or do not have a therapeutic antibody level to tetanus, um, diphtheria, and measles are the ones that have been looked at so far. I mean, I think we're just, should we be asking, are all these reports, especially in California, of uh, outbreaks of measles and whooping cough, is this really because the kids aren't being vaccinated? 
Or are some of these kids just not being protected because um, of past exposures? Um, and then we have to understand how behavioral, uh, for example, and SES factors can interact with environmental exposures to identify prevention. Um, we have to start looking at emerging environmental threats to human health on both a global and local scale. I want to say that you know, NIEHS was the first NIH institute at the table uh, after the Gulf of oil spill two and a half years ago. Uh, we are conducting a very, very large study of people who were involved in the cleanup, but we also formed, um, formed a consortium with seven of our, uh, seven of our institute um, partners to form an academic community consortium that involves 26 different community groups looking at issues of women's health, children's health, and resiliency in the Gulf area, because the Gulf Never mind things like the, the oil spill, they are constantly being hit, for example, with hurricanes. Right now, actually, I have three of my people are actually participating in a meeting tomorrow up in New York related to Hurricane Sandy and the opportunities for research um, to, to get some information so we can look at the impacts of that, long-term impacts on the health of people in that area, for example. So trying to act proactively with other public health partners and focusing on research needs to inform policy responses. So I know fracking isn't a big deal in California, but some of you from New York State, or if we've got anybody here from Pennsylvania or Ohio, uh, North Carolina, other places, if it hasn't happened, Colorado, it's already happened tremendously there. If it hasn't happened yet, it will. And we really have to understand uh, how that can be done safely and what we can do to prevent um, adverse health effects. Um, we have to really establish an environmental health disparities research agenda because we know that those in our population least able to deal with environmental insults are the ones that have disproportionate risks. Um, and we have to define and support public health and prevention solutions so that we absolutely have to do community-based participatory <coughs> research. We are also looking at research and education on ethical, legal, and social implications of environmental health research and tried to uh, recommend interventions to reduce um, or eliminate environmental exposures that cause the greatest burden of disease. Can't do any of this. As I said, one of the overarching themes is knowledge management, and we have to uh, expand the knowledge management so that everyone has access to the information to make it more collaborative for the environmental health sciences um, community. Um, we have to really need more development of bioinformatic and biostatistic and data integration tools, and that we have to really invest in making things publicly available, both resources and computational tools. We've got to improve the teaching of environmental health sciences at all level of education and training. I mentioned this morning to um, our community partners that the level of scientific literacy in this country is appalling. Um, I think you just have to read some of the things or listen to the radio to realize the complete lack of any understanding of basic scientific principles. And we have to really uh, help make uh, the population aware of health consequences, environmental exposures. So we need to empower individuals at all levels of education, strengthen environmental health science education and literacy, develop critical training pro um, programs that are tailored for different audiences, and we've got to get environmental health sciences into uh, medical education and practice. And I'm not just talking to the, about MDs here. I'm talking about our nurses, our other public health professionals, so that they have an increased awareness. I know my son told me when he was in med school, he had one hour of environmental health um, education in four years of medical school. Um, so another is, is to, uh, to develop the next generation of environmental health scientists to move our transformative environment and health sciences forward and train the next generation of leaders can only do this if we start getting disciplines to work together and people need a great deal of more cross-disciplinary training, for example, in engineering and behavioral sciences and informatics and so on. We are trying to recruit trainees from other um, disciplines to diversify the base. We have to increase opportunities across um, and across the lifespan of everybody's career. We need to get it more into medical education so that we have more physicians and nurses and pharmacists trained in environmental health. We have to build this capacity in countries around the world because 
While we do have pockets of tremendous health disparities in, in this country, in some of our inner cities, some of our rural communities, certainly in some of our tribal communities, you know, if you go to other parts of the world, we know that the levels of environmental exposure in some of these um, areas are approach that seen in occupational exposures. I'm going to India in two weeks for three days, and I'm go just going to Delhi, and I, if I were to tell you that the levels of air pollution in Delhi now exceed by two orders of magnitude the levels of that are considered um, safe in this country. Um, then they've actually come to the U.S. and are asking for help and what can they do to try to reduce this horrendous levels of exposure. And then we have to increase diversity within the training program. This is not unique to environmental health scientists. This is true for all scientists. Uh, the tenth goal is a really new one for us, and this is to look at the economic impact of policies. If you didn't already know it, in the current atmosphere, it's money talks. And we have to be able to monetize what the benefits are of controlling environmental exposures. We have to monetize how much it costs when people you know, can't go to work because the air's so bad that they're having major asthma attacks. We have to monetize it, um, and we have to figure out how to do that. So this whole looking at the economic benefits and getting the costs is, is a new approach for us, but something that's absolutely essential if we would like our budget to increase. And the last goal is that we've got to get communication going. Bidirectional is actually too narrow. It's all around and through the circle and collaborations between the researchers and all the different kinds of stakeholders to advance translation into, in, in the environmental health sciences um, into the communities. We would like NIHS to be the most trusted and accessible source of environmental health science information. We're really working to identify our communities we want to build and lead long-term um, partnerships with both federal and non-federal um, health education agencies and mission-related stakeholder groups. We want to conduct research on how do we do this with communities and how do we communicate better. So communication, we know, is a science, and how do we do that related to environmental health? And we have to develop an integrated searchable knowledge base on the in impact of environment on health. So the guy, those, that's the strategic plan. Now what are we going to do? You know, what are we going to do? When are we going to do it? Uh, how much is it going to cost? So NIH divisions have now taken all these goals, gone back, and developed implementation plans for each division that have been brought to leadership. And the leadership is now integrating these plans into a one NIEHS approach. And there were seven topics that cross all the interests of all of the, the three divisions and the two offices that we have at NIEHS, and we formed implementation planning teams um, that are co-led by people from at least two of the five divisions. And you can see that every group here is represented, but the topics that clearly cross the interests um, of everyone were epigenetics, and epigenetics are those um, the th Epigenetics are the marks on uh, DNA and the proteins that control the expression of genes. Some of these can be uh, inherited from generation to generation if they occur in germ cells. Um, they can certainly be inherited. And this is what makes your skin cell different from your lung cell, different from another part of your body. Or this is what makes one identical twin different from another identical twin. Um, inflammation is turning out to be a basic underlying um, cause of many uh, health conditions that have to be looked at. Stem cells, I mentioned stem cells before. We are very excited about the potential for use of these to address all kinds of questions. Um, the exposome I've mentioned, and this, this is the agnostic approach to trying to understand the totality of exposure. And another science area that's absolutely essential is we're moving toxicology from a descriptive science to a predictive science so that we can understand what, um, you know, before you have to test everything to the nth degree, we'll have warnings of which chemicals are of concern. We're looking at knowledge management and um, e-science, environmental science, and we're looking at getting the word out. You know, today, um, I, I, I just know that, you know, if I need anything done related to communication with electronic devices, I go to my, my 11-year-old grandson and say, Matan, tell me how to do this, because 
we're way out of it if you're a little bit older. I'm not doing a lot of tweeting and Twittering, but I think a lot of people are, especially the younger ones. I still talk on that cell phone, but you know, younger people are texting all the time. And we've got to move up and begin to understand what are the key issues here with social media. Just wanted to remind you that the implications of environmental effects for public health, it's the big scale um, changes that cause the most cost savings. It's the banning of lead from gasoline. It's the control of the levels of particulate matter or ozone that are in the air. The second is the non-clinical person-directed intervention, telling people, you know, don't drink so much, don't smoke so much, exercise more. And the least cost savings are the clinical interventions. Partially why is that? It's the issue of whether you're affecting one person a little or um, one person a lot or the whole population a little um, that leads to the cost savings. So the new vision for NIEHS and NTP is we're partnering with our sister institutes and other federal agencies much more than we used to, that it's both health and the environment is our priority. We're looking at the new issues and technologies. We need individual as well as, but even more so, team science to address complex diseases and complex environmental impacts. We have to improve integration across research discipline and with all of our partners. And we have to improve our translation and communication of basic science into human health protection. So thanks all of you, and I'm really glad to be here.